So last week I was wanting to conclude my series on being passionate worshipers and lovers of God. And I spoke about how can we keep our love for God strong. And um, I decided I'm going to piggyback on that just a little bit today still as well. And um, I'm going to share briefly out of the, my last recommended book uh, that's, that's been in the bulletin for the last month, uh, John Ortberg's book, The Life You've Always Wanted. And so some of the things that I share today will grow out of that book, because I just feel like um, this is the book um, that I, I hope some of you picked up and read, and um, I'm just going to refer to some aspects of that uh, today. And so I just felt like I should kind of tie it into uh, the whole series I've been doing just in terms of, okay, so are there things we can do to really be lovers of God? Four people shared last Sunday things that they do uh, regularly in terms of that, and, and so I'll, I'll refer to that stuff as well. Let me begin by uh, just a, a short little story here. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a small group of us who were talking about the challenge race, or Ironman, uh, the full distance uh, or full length challenge. And this one fella who, not from, he's, not, he's not in here, okay, don't worry, who was that, you know? <laughs> this one fella, mid-40s, um, not very physically fit, naively said at one point, oh, I could do the race. Anybody could do that race. I might not do it real fast, but anybody could do that race. Well, I tried to bring some reality to the conversation, but what this fella didn't know was he didn't know what he didn't know. The reality is you would not be able to, he would not be able to complete a full length of challenge or Ironman if you did not train. You could not do it by just trying really, really hard. Trying hard is good in various situations, but it will only get you so far. The race of the Christian life is far more demanding than doing the challenge race or any kind of athletic race. And so in this whole thing of wanting to be lovers of God, in the way that we've described, which we've said results in also being lovers of our neighbors, we won't get there just by trying really hard. For those of you being baptized today, you won't get where you're now wanting to go by just trying really hard. It takes regular training. And so this morning what I'd like to call my message is training to keep our love for God strong, or this is actually a subtitle out of uh, uh, John Ortberg's book uh, on one chapter, Training Versus Trying. And here's a principle to begin with, uh, and it's from that book. There is an immense difference between training to do something and trying to do something. There are several places in Scripture where it talks about this whole thing of training, and one of those is in 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verses 7 to 8. Paul's writing to Timothy, and he's obviously addressing a specific situation that was present in that time, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. And this is the part I'm wanting to zero in on. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. And so the context of these verses very clearly is Paul's drawing parallels between physical training for a race versus spiritual training for this whole thing that we have now come to faith in Christ and we've chosen to begin this walk with Jesus. And he's saying, you know what? To do this thing requires regular ongoing training. Another scripture, also from Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. And again, he's talking about this whole thing of running a race. Um, he says, everyone who competes in the games, and by the way, uh, Corinth had the Isthmian, it's always hard to say, Isthmian games, um, which was only second to the actual Olympics uh, that happened in Greece. Um, and so he was very familiar with what was going on. He's actually comparing the Christian life study. He says, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. We do it 
we do what? We train, we do it to get a crown that will last forever. And it's interesting, he uses a couple of different analogies. He talks about the running of a race. He also talks about boxing in those verses there. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, and he's, he's, he's equating those to what we're doing in, in our walk with God. Depending on how seriously you take an actual physical race determines how seriously you take your training that you enter into, and what race you're doing determines specifically what kind of training you do towards that. What we do know is for any kind of uh, athlete who's really serious about racing in some way, he will never enter into that race without doing an extended period of training. Likewise, for us as Christians, and specifically uh, in terms of this whole area of wanting to keep the strong love for God, there are certain training exercises, if you want to put them that way, that all of us can enter into, and they will vary depending on our personality and all those kinds of things, but there are training exercises that we can do to regularly participate in that race, so to speak, and do well at that race. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, this comes out of the, the book I'm referring to as well, um, says, Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. And so the four people that, that shared last week shared some things that they regularly do that enable them to walk this walk, that enable them to keep their love for God strong. And, and typically, what we've, how we've referred to those things that they shared about are spiritual disciplines. Interesting, certain activities that some of them said they do regularly and enable them to live that way, um, we may not even refer to those as spiritual disciplines. I don't know if you remember uh, Randall and Margaret. Um, Margaret shared, and for those of you that don't know what they do for a living, they're both realtors, and she said, you know, when we have a particularly demanding day ahead of us, we put on Andy Park's song, We Will Ride. And by the way, I know they turn it up really loud. <clears throat> um, in fact, talk to Randall sometime. Uh, he had actually had police come and riot gear to his door once because they thought there was this huge party going on, and it was him with his music on, worshiping God. Um, so when they put on music, they'd like to put it on really loud. Um, and, and so that, that's, that is a spiritual discipline. That's something they've said. You know what? It helps us. We put that song on. You know, we're going to ride with you, God. We're going to do this thing, you know. Um, and so um, there are various things that various ones of us can do that enable us to walk the life that God has now called us to. And so those are spiritual disciplines. Um, from, from John Ortberg's book, a discipline is any activity I can do by direct effort that will help me do what I cannot now do by direct effort. Let me read you um, just a brief excerpt out of this book, which I think is very helpful to do with this whole thing of effort and discipline. In the children's book, Frog and Toad Together, any of you heard of that book? Okay. <laughs> I hadn't. The two central characters discover the limits of mere trying when Frog bakes a batch of cookies. We ought to stop eating, they say, as they keep eating. We must stop, they resolve, as they eat some more. We need willpower, Frog finally says, grabbing another cookie. What is willpower, asked Toad, swallowing another mouthful. Willpower is trying very hard not to do something you want to do very much, Frog said. Frog discusses a variety of ways to help with willpower, putting the cookies in a box, tying the box shut, putting them high up in a tree. But each time, T Toad points out, in between bites, that they could climb the tree and untie the box. In desperation, Frog finally dumps the remaining cookies outside on the ground. Hey, birds, he calls, here's cookies. Now we have no more cookies, says Toad sadly. Yes, says Frog, 
but we have lots and lots of willpower. You may keep it all, Toad replies. I'm going home to bake a cake. <laughs> so disciplines are valuable simply because they allow us to do what we cannot do by willpower alone. So, what makes something a spiritual discipline? Any activity that can help me gain power to live life as Jesus taught and modeled it. And so, in determining what practices all of us can incorporate into our lives, obviously if we're, if we're saying, hey, I wanna, I wanna walk this walk that Jesus calls us to walk, one of the first things we want to determine, of course, is what does it look like uh, to live in the kingdom of God? What, what is a clear understanding of what that means? I'd like to suggest, obviously we could spend a whole bunch of time just talking about this, but let me just say one thing as a bit of a summary uh, for that, that whole area of what it means to live in the kingdom. I would like to suggest today that a key to remaining connected to Jesus or, or a key to living that walk is to remain connected to him, to live in that place continually. Uh, in John 15, verse 5, Jesus gives this whole analogy of, of a, uh, a vine, a grapevine, and he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And then in verse 9, thinking of this whole thing of, of, okay, how do we keep our love for God strong? He equates this thing of staying connected to him, of remaining in him, to remaining in his love. And so if we think of, okay, overall, we're talking big picture now. What does it mean to live in the kingdom of God? Well, one of the, the, the most uh, foundational things. It's this thing of staying in this connection with him. And so if, if you think today of the things I'm talking about, what are the things that enable each of us? If, if you're saying, I want to follow Jesus, I want to walk the way he's called me to walk now, the key thing we're asking ourselves constantly, how do I stay in that connection with him on a day-by-day -day basis? What things can we actually do to live there? And, and, and what things can we do that will actually empower us to actually walk that way? And so I'm going to talk about those things in just a bit. Let me say a few other things about spiritual disciplines, first of all. Spiritual disciplines are not a barometer of spirituality. As I'm talking about this topic, there may be some of you that go, oh, okay, I don't have to pay too much attention today. I've got this one down pat already. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> this may sound really strange. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I was preparing all this stuff, and, and I basically finished the message, and I, I was driving home, and I remember specifically driving into my garage, and this thought comes to my mind. You know, it, it, let me back up. When, when, I, when I prepare my messages, I always prepare them from the perspective, okay, God, what are you saying to me on this? Where, where do you want me to continue to grow in this area? And so I had this thought, oh, well, I don't have to worry about this one. I've got this one down. <laughs> and I realized how easily I can, we can all get smug and think, okay, I got this one, you know. I'd like to suggest spiritual disciplines in themselves are not a barometer of spirituality. Otherwise, the Pharisees would have won hands down because they had this thing in terms of praying, in terms of reading the scriptures. Um, I think most of you know that Derek and Angie's daughter, Vanessa, is playing basketball down in the States uh, on a basketball scholarship going to university. It doesn't matter how many baskets she gets in practice. The only thing that matters is how many baskets she gets during the game. Now, her accuracy in the game has everything to do with how well she practiced, but what counts is the game. And so the barometer for you and me is not how much we are disciplined, 
the barometer is how much does it affect our lives? How much does it affect what I do tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day? We know that Scripture, for example, as one spiritual discipline, we know that Scripture has the power to affect us. I think of 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, where it says, all Scripture is God-breathed. Scripture is God speaking. <laughs> okay, This isn't just a book. This is God speaking. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. We know this book is useful for training, the very thing we're talking about. Related to this, let me, let me also say, disciplines also are not a way to earn favor with God. Sorry, let me back up on here. In other words, sometimes as we begin to talk about this, we can subconsciously think, oh, God must really like this. <laughs> and yes, those things all hopefully help us in terms of how we live our lives. But in and of themselves, spiritual disciplines are not the barometer. The other thing I'd like to say as we're talking about this is your season of life or your unique temperament are never a hindrance. I think of some of our young mums here in the church and uh, thinking of one in particular. I won't say who that is, Allison. Um, but, you know, three young kids, <laughs> three and under, or, yeah, I guess... Uh, he's still three at this point. Um, young moms cannot necessarily say, okay, every morning at 8 o'clock, I'm going to take an hour. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to pray and seek God during that time. Isn't going to happen. And sometimes, depending on our season of life, we can think, well, man, I, I just can't live for God. I just can't seek God the way I'd like to in this time of life. I'd like to say that no season of life is a hindrance, no matter what you're going through. Or sometimes as an older person, there's things you find harder to do. No season of life is a hindrance in terms of our walk with God. But in every season of life, we can find ways and means to do it, and it won't look the same as it might in another season of life. Nor does our temperament dictate what is, okay, are we really cutting it? Because our temperament is very different than somebody else's. There are some of you in this room, I'm sure, where music is not, there you are, Allison. <laughs> You're sitting there so peacefully. Where's all the kids? Up there. woo -hoo! Thank God for nurseries. <laughs> what was I talking about? <laughs> oh, temperaments, right. <laughs> there are some of you, okay, I'm going to point, not, not to see Allison. Um, music obviously moves her in terms of worship to God. There are some of you in this room where music just doesn't really do it for you. And for those of you where music does it for you, you go, huh? Well, how do you mean? Like, really? Is that possible for someone to not get moved by music? God will enable you to worship God and to find other ways that work for you. There are some of you that find it very hard to sit still in a room for an hour. It would drive you crazy. But maybe the way for you to go and pray is to get out and walk and pray. You hear what I'm saying? Our, our temperament is not a hindrance in terms of our walk with God. What we want to do is find what are the ways that we can train so that we can walk with God in our season of life with our temperament. So having said that, let me suggest to us today that it's, it's crucial for all of us to establish, considering our temperament, our season of life, some kind of regular spiritual workout routine. Some way of training regularity. From a physical perspective, uh, in terms of a physical race, or physically staying fit, 
we all know there are certain things that are really helpful. It's, it's, it's good to do something regularly that gets our cardio going. It's, it's good to do something for strength training. It's good to do a certain amount of time, certain frequency. Spiritually, there are things that Scripture tells us to do on some kind of a regular basis. And one of those, obviously, is this whole thing of, if this thing is relationship with God, then we want to be ones who are listening to him. <laughs> we want to be ones who are taking the time to regularly hear God. And one of those primary ways is reading Scripture. As I already said, 2 Timothy 3.16 this book is God-breathed. It's God speaking. It's a means of training. And so however that works for you, find ways to regularly be hearing God through Scripture. It's helpful to read various books and understand that they are books and that they are, they are written to, you know, for specific purposes. Um, but take the time regularly. Like I said last week, don't just read Scripture. Read it and take time to listen. Take time to hear, okay, God, what are you saying? Calvin, where's Calvin? Are you, there he is. Calvin, uh, I was just talking to him a little while ago, and he talked to me about the book that I've recommended uh, at this point, uh, Wayne Cordero's book, The Divine Mentor. And um, I've started practicing what he talks about in that book. And, I've, you know, sometimes I find it's helpful just to do another means. And uh, in this book, he talks about the soap means. And he says, as you're reading Scripture, I'll just tell you what I have, have tried to do over the last while. I read a couple of chapters of Scripture um, on, a, on a regular basis. And, and then after I've read, I say, okay, God, what Scriptures are you specifically really speaking to me about? And I will take a couple of those verses or one of those verses or a phrase and I'll write it down and take one page, don't use more than a page, um, and, and I'll, I'll just actually write that scripture out. And then an observation, I'll write down, okay, what, is, what are these verses actually saying? What, what was the original intent in terms of what's being communicated here? And then I will take the time specifically to say, okay, how is this applying to my life right now? What's God saying right now for me? And I'll actually write that stuff down. And then my prayer will specifically to be to do with that kind of stuff in terms of how God is speaking at this time uh, to me. By the way, those being baptized, uh, if you want to uh, go get ready for that. And before you go, make sure you go on the Internet to hear the rest of this because it's really important for you guys. Okay? So, um, and uh, I think Angie went to go get the kids as well. So, uh, secondly, um, and, and some of you talked about this last week, uh, this whole area of prayer, Jesus assumes, sorry, Jesus assumes that his followers will set aside time for personal prayer. And again, doesn't matter how you do it, doesn't matter where you do it, but Jesus assumes that. Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, he says, When you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your Father who is unseen. What Jesus was not saying in this verse was it's always got to be in a room, it's always got to be with a closed door. He's not saying that at all because we know that we, we don't even have a record of Jesus going in a room and pray, but we have various records of him going up in the mountain and praying. <laughs> so it's not about that. It's get off by yourself regularly. Take time regularly to go and pray to your Father. Pray for the things that concern you. Pray for those people around you. And one of the biggest things that you've probably heard me say this before, one of the biggest things is what would it look like as you're praying for other people, what would it look like if, if God totally had his way? What does it look like for God's will to be done in that person's life just like it's being done in heaven? Pray that. Ask God to do that in people's lives. So, the regular discipline of prayer. Let me, the, the third one I'd like to really emphasize here is fellowship. Um, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Excuse me. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. 
I love the analogy, and, and some of you may have heard this one before, but it bears repeating that uh, the analogy that Nicky Gumbel gives in the Alpha course of this whole area. And he, he talks about this younger fellow going to an older Christian, and they're sitting in a living room, and fireplace was, the fire was burning in the fireplace. Actually, there's just coals in the fire, fireplace still. And, and the younger Christian was like, well, I just really having difficulty really, you know, going strong in my walk with God. And, and uh, in the process, obviously, this older Christian realized that this person wasn't participating regularly in fellowship. And he simply, the older fellow didn't say a word. He just went to the fire, took the tongs, and took one of the hot coals and put it out on the hearth, went and sat down for a while. And that coal totally went black. And then after a while, he went and took the tongs again and took the coal and put it back in the fire. And the coals got hot again. It turned bright red again. And uh, I think what a great picture of the need that all of us have regularly to interact with each other it's one of the reasons we emphasize the whole thing of small groups. Uh, we have the official means like this. Hopefully you're interacting with people before and after and during the break and praying with each other and all that stuff. This is, I believe, a vital time for all of us. But the smaller group times are vital for all of us just as much. But even beyond that, there's all kinds of opportunity to be interacting with each other and spurring each other on. And it's not just about getting together. It's about let's make sure we are spurring each other on. <laughs> let's make sure we are coming alongside each other. Um, I know for myself, uh, regularly participating in the men's group, uh, there's something that happens in those times. And, and you know what? Not each meeting is like a woo! fantastic you know it's just building into each other's lives there's just something about sharpening each other in those times there's there's various additional practices we talk about the whole thing of reading good books by by uh, good christian authors and and it's something that i've tried to do for for a number of years i i probably read at least a book a month sometimes two or three and i'm not a real strong reader okay um, and so I encourage you. It's one reason we started putting this thing in the bulletin as some of you, well, what do I read? You know, um, There's something that God uses in that process. I said this before in the whole series. I said, remember, you are as close to God as you choose to be. <laughs> and so this whole thing of, of uh, disciplines towards that. Let me say one more thing, and that is special training routine. I mentioned in the First Corinthians passage that Paul uses the analogy of a runner, and he also uses the analogy of a boxer. How a boxer trains is very different than how a runner trains. And likewise, in our lives, as we look at, okay, what, what are things that God's wanting to build into my life? You may think of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, Patience. Hmm, God wants to build some patience into my life. Well, what things might God want you to do to start to learn patience? I heard of one uh, possible example of that. I'm glad I don't have to learn patience. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, he suggested for a whole week as you're driving anywhere, especially on the highway, stay in the right-hand lane behind the slowest driver and give yourself enough time to get to work to drive that way for a whole week. Whoa. A discipline of learning patience. Um, are there other things that God wants to build into your life? Let me, I know all the kids are coming in. I want to I wanna just finish with this still. Um, in terms of disciplines that God would build into our lives, I'm just going to read one more section from uh, this book. Uh, Josh, can we set up a stand uh, by the, oh, it's there. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to read one more part in the book. Just to, just to conclude here, he talks about disciplines of engagement. Okay, everybody with me? Hello, hello, hello. Okay, good to see you, kids. Okay, he talks about disciplines of engagement, which are disciplines of doing, and he talks about disciplines of abstinence. 
refraining from doing. Now let me just, in light of that, I'm, I know I'm jumping in midstream here, so I just thought I'd give you that first before I start reading. So let me just read this. Dallas Willard notes that spiritual disciplines can be placed in two categories, disciplines of engagement and disciplines of abstinence. Disciplines of engagement involve my intentionally doing certain things. Worship, study, fellowship, and giving are all disciplines of engagement. By contrast, disciplines of abstinence include my intentionally refraining from things. Those include practices such as fasting, solitude, and silence. Here's the connection. Okay, listen to this. Here's the connection. If I struggle with a sin of commission, I will generally be helped by practicing a discipline of abstinence. In other words, if my problem is that I am doing something I not, ought not to do, I need to practice a discipline that strengthens my not doing muscles. So if you have a problem with boasting, a sin of commission, what disciplines are likely to help? If you said silence or secrecy, both disciplines of abstinence, you're right, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> but if I struggle with a sin of omission, I will usually be most helped by a discipline of engagement. That is, if my sin involves a failure to love or encourage or serve, I need practices that will help my doing muscle. If, for example, you wrestle with joylessness, you will want to immerse yourself in my favorite discipline of all, the discipline of celebration. And you have to read the book to find out what that is. <clears throat> so um, he talks about disciplines regularly of building more joy into our lives and actively doing uh, things towards that. So I wanted to wrap this all up to talk about this because this is one of those bread and butter <laughs> messages where, you know what, we all need to practice this. We all need to be doing this stuff on some kind of a regular basis. We need to find out what works for us. Some of you have been practicing various ones of these, so my challenge to you today, again, is to make sure they've got fresh life to them. Make sure you're not just going through the motions, but you're actually hearing from God. You're actually growing. You're actually changing in the process. For some of you here this morning, you may go, man, I've never done any of this. I've, I've never taken regular time to read Scripture or pray. My challenge to you today is start small. If you've never run a marathon, you don't get out and try to run one. You, you get out and run maybe half a mile or a mile. Uh, same thing with this. Start with 15 minutes a day where you, where you set aside that time and say, okay, I'm going to start doing it. I'm going to start going through Scripture. I'm going to read it. I'm just going to start saying, okay, I'm going to pause after that and say, God, what are you saying to me today? Um, begin there. <clears throat> and so I just really want to encourage us all in this whole area. Um, the beauty of this, we can do something that enables us to do something we can't just do now by just trying hard. And so my hope is that uh, all of us out of this will go, okay, here's, here's the steps I can take. And so I'm encouraging all of you today, what, what is God saying to you today? What steps will you take today? Where will you start? There may be some of you today, as we've talked about this whole thing of relationship with God, where you go, I don't even know what that all means. I, I've never even, uh, I've never come to that place of knowing who he is and, and what he's done for us. And so we'd love to chat with you after the service. If you want to come up here, we'd love to uh, talk with you about that.